Hi, everyone. Um, it's wonderful to see you. Welcome. Hopefully you're in the right place for our fellows in the field. What students can teach us about free speech and inclusion, it's complicated. For those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Michelle Deutschman. I'm the executive director of the UC National Center for Free Speech and Civic Engagement. I'm so happy you could join us today for our third and final Fellows in the Field workshop. If you're new to the center, you might not know about our National Fellows Program. Each year, the center selects fellows from a broad range of disciplines and backgrounds, such as law, journalism, higher education, social science, technology, and government. And fellows receive funding to conduct research that furthers the national conversation related to expression and democratic participation on college campuses, including how to advance campus dialogue, safeguard academic freedom, and further diversity and inclusion. Our fellows in the field workshops are an opportunity for people in the field like you to hear directly from our fellows about their projects and how they can help you in your daily work. Before I introduce Beth and we delve into her research, I just want to acknowledge what a challenging time it has been on campuses and in the world at large. Free expression issues have exploded at colleges and universities. The questions are difficult and made more so by the intensity of emotion, passion, and belief. One issue that has been much discussed is the question of institutional speech. When should college and universities speak up about world events and when should they stay silent? We are hosting an upcoming webinar on this very topic in partnership with PEN America. If you've not already registered, you can do so by clicking on the link that was just dropped into the Q&A. It's happening December 7th. Additionally, the, fellow work, the fellows work product that I mentioned earlier is created with all of you in mind, the people who are managing and responding to these trying and tense situations. We're going to drop a link to all the research from the last class, but I want to draw particular attention to three pieces of research. The first is Danny Sheha's work on universities' responses to offensive and bias-related speech and behaviors, very topical. Emma Tolliver's work on student advocacy. She was an undergrad who created a toolkit for undergraduate advocates. And the work by Brandy Hefner LeBanc and Neil Hutchins on social media, the real campus speech zone. During today's conversation, please feel free to share your questions in the Q&A and Beth and I will do our best to get to as many of them as possible. If you want to enable captioning, click the button at the bottom of your screen that says turn on caption. Now to our main event. Today, we are hearing from Dr. Elizabeth Nyhaus, an associate professor in the Department of Educational Administration at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Beth's current research focuses on how we can create and improve educational environments to facilitate student learning and development in higher ed, with a particular emphasis on the intersection of issues of free speech, academic freedom, and campus climate. At the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, Beth teaches courses on diversity issues in higher education, college student development, research methods, and free speech and campus climate. Beth was a center fellow in 2020-21, as well as the center's inaugural senior fellow this past year. During both of her tenures at the center, she studied the important and often misunderstood concept of student self-censorship. Today, she will help unpack the widely accepted narrative that students are afraid to speak up in class for fear of repercussions. Beth will show how diving into the nuance and complexity of discussing controversial issues with diverse peers can ultimately lead us to develop improved strategies for promoting robust, productive classroom discussions. Beth, before the participants and I have a chance to ask you questions, I want to give you the opportunity to share an overview of your work and your findings, and I'm going to invite you to take it away. Great. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so, yes, I do have uh, a few PowerPoint slides that I'll get up here in just a second. Um, so I can tell you all a little bit about the work that I've been doing with the center, and then uh, we will have plenty of opportunity for um, Q and A. There we go. 
All right. Um, so I do want to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, and before I jump in, I also want to uh, give you a heads up that the research that I'm basing my overview on uh, focuses on potentially offensive things that students might say in a class discussion. So there very well might be uh, quotes that I've incorporated here, words that come up, or ideas that you find offensive. Um, and hopefully any reactions that you have to the words or ideas that I'm sharing here, um, positive or negative, will be good fodder for our subsequent discussion. So I want to start off by framing the issue here a bit. Um, if you've signed up for a webinar like this, you are probably quite familiar with the endless stream of headlines about controversies over issues of free speech and academic freedom on college campuses. And for the most part, what I find um, when folks are talking about these controversies, they often do so in a way that frames these issues as fairly straightforward. It's just an issue of free speech, or that's just racist, or it's just wokeness run amok or it's just my opinion or my religious belief, or it's just censorship or just this or just that. And what I'm gonna argue here today though, is that there's nothing simple about these issues and it's almost never just one thing or another. My perspective on this has been informed by my research over the past two and a half years um, as a fellow and then senior fellow with the center, serving and conducting interviews with college students at seven diverse institutions across the country. Most of what I'm going to talk about is based on in-depth interviews with over 50 students uh, conducted by myself and four amazing grad students who have been working with me on the project over the past few years. Uh, the focus of our interviews has been on these questions at the bottom here. How do students think about potentially offensive classroom speech and how do they think about their own speech in the classroom? Uh, our focus was on classroom discussions, but I think a lot of what we found could also apply outside the classroom as well. In our interviews, we talked with students about two contrasting scenarios, uh, one where a student named Jamie makes an offensive comment about police officers, and the other where a student uh, makes an offensive comment about Black Lives Matter protesters. Uh, in follow-up interviews with most of the students, we also were able to dig into specifics about how they navigate when, how, and whether to speak up in class, particularly when what they have to say uh, is something they think others in the class might not agree with. Uh, for some context, just over half of the participants in the study identified as white, uh, with the rest spread out across various minoritized racial identities. Uh, just over half identified as cisgender women, uh, one as genderqueer slash transmasculine, and the rest as men. Um, and we had a spread across political orientations as well. Uh, 15 identified themselves as somewhat or very conservative, nine as middle of the road, and 27 as somewhat or very liberal. So as we dug into these interviews, the overall main theme that has come up in pretty much all of these conversations with students is it's complicated. Um, and you can see here just a few of the quotes that I've pulled out of the interviews where students themselves are acknowledging just how hard these issues are. Um, it was striking reading through the transcripts and just recognizing how many times students would say, I don't know, in the interviews. So what I want to spend the rest of my time talking about is, is what is so complicated about controversial or potentially offensive classroom speech. And to start, I want to talk through some of the historical context uh, before jumping into what's happening in classrooms today. Don't worry, not too much. Um, but one of the things that I realized when I was talking with students and juxtaposing what they were telling me about their experiences with what I hear of in discussions about speech controversies on campus was that often non-students would reference the good old days in one way or another. Uh, they discuss with nostalgia what things used to be like when students and faculty could have these rousing debates about just about anything without worrying about offending anyone. But as one of the participants in the project said, um, quote, if you're in a class of just white people and people that look and think exactly like you, it's easier to say more insensitive things. So that nostalgia that people feel for what they see as a simpler time is just misplaced. The only reason that they uh, things may have felt simple for those involved was that the folks who might be offended by what they were discussing and debating generally weren't even allowed in those conversations. And if they were allowed to be there, they definitely weren't speaking up and voicing their objections. Since then, we have made a lot of progress in opening up higher education to many people who had been historically excluded based on gender, race, sexual orientation, religious affiliation, and a wide array of other characteristics. We, of course, have a long way to go, <laughs> but we've definitely made progress. 
but the increasing diversity of our college campuses and classrooms has made it impossible, or at least very difficult, for anyone to pretend that people can just say whatever they want, whenever they want, or however they want. And then there's all these other layers that students talked about that make classroom conversations complicated. Social media being one of those, and then everything else that's going on in the world that affects all of us. Our classrooms are not somehow walled off from racial injustice, pandemics, or political strife. And the students feel this in their classroom discussions. So digging in further to what exactly is complicated about having classroom conversations in this context, Many of the students that I spoke with reflected on the fact that most things that are worth discussing in class involve issues where there's no clear right or wrong answer. And this in and of itself is challenging. So one of the first things that's complicated about classroom discussions is just figuring out what it means to know something, what we know to be true or what's just an opinion and whether or not that actually even matters. So as I was analyzing the interview uh, transcripts, a section of Ferdinand's interview stood out to me is highlighting how difficult this can be. Um, we were talking about whether or not it matters if an offensive comment is true. And he said, quote, I think the truth value of the comment matters. A statement of fact like that, I think would be fine, but a statement of an opinion, I'm not sure how to phrase it exactly, but like a statement of opinion that kind of reflects something, even if it's mostly or fully true, that's attacking people for their identity would be wrong, but maybe not as, or will be more wrong than I'm going around in circles in my head. So this is not to say that students don't have any idea about what's true or not true or what does or does not count as legitimate knowledge. A number of students talked about how when you make a comment in class, you have to back it up with evidence. But what counts as evidence to back up a claim in class isn't always easy to figure out. For many students, personal experience or even religious faith played a role in what they considered to be valid justification for an assertion in a class discussion. And this was particularly evident when we talked with students about whether the racial identity of a speaker making a comment, uh, particularly an offensive comment about Black Lives Matter protesters would matter. There was a lot of disagreement <laughs> on that question uh, with many students feeling like they would give more credence to a Black speaker criticizing Black Lives Matter protesters. Um, but then on the other hand, there were students like Kennedy, uh, who was a Black student who highlighted how personal experience with a topic could often cause other folks to discount what she was saying rather than giving more weight to it. Um, she explained, quote, sometimes people won't listen to you. As a person of color, like sometimes people won't hear it from me, but they'll hear it from another person who's saying the exact same thing. Just seeing me and my identity first and being like, oh, well, you have too much personal stake in this or something and making it easy for them to write me off versus if a white person says it, they're more likely to listen. This question of who has knowledge and what counts as legitimate foundation for knowledge claims also played a role in how students saw their own role and the role of the other students in their class in discussions. For some students, everyone brings a form of knowledge to a class discussion and the points to learn from one another. Others saw knowledge as more concrete, as something that exists in the world, and their role in college was to learn the facts they need, often to prepare them for future jobs. So this question of what role students play in class discussions led to a second set of complicated issues about our obligations to one another as members of a classroom community or just as other human beings. <laughs> if the point or at least a point of a class discussion is to learn from one another, students recognize that this means that their contributions should further that goal. And sometimes that means not saying anything at all. Nora described this saying, quote, there's a point in which to express everything you want to express is making it more difficult for someone else to do so. Then I think that's not positive for the same reason that it wouldn't be if you didn't get to express everything you want to, because it's not a group of strangers. It's a group that you have relationships with. We're a community, we're interconnected, and we need to look out for everybody else too. For some students, there is an ethical obligation to express themselves in a way that can be helpful to other students individually and to the community of students in the class as a whole. Staying silent was sometimes the best way to accomplish this goal and to fulfill this ethical obligation. At the same time, students also recognize that if folks don't speak up in class, that can be just as unproductive as if they do. To some extent, students also have an obligation to one another to contribute to the discussion. Eve talked about this, talking about how if the point of a class discussion is to hear different perspectives, that can only happen if other students are speaking up, even if it's not what she wants to hear. 
So of course, as with everything, this is complicated. None of this is straightforward. Yes, students acknowledge that they need to be considerate of others, that they need to take into consideration other students' learning and well-being and not just their own. But as Alexander talked about, you can't always anticipate how things are going to affect others. And it may not be reasonable to expect that students will consider all possible effects on other students before saying anything. So as you can hear in all these perspectives uh, that I'm talking about, students do generally see the potential for what folks say in a class discussion to cause harm in one way or another. As Tony explained, when an offensive comment is made in class, quote, it could create a negative feeling. It could create animosity between the students. It could, I mean, affect some students to the point where they're emotionally upset and they kind of shut off or become withdrawn from that student or from the class. Kennedy similarly described that when a comment rises to the level of targeted hate speech, it can have a negative effect, particularly on students of color in the room. As she explained, quote, as a person of color, like you can tell when it's hate speech. It's when you're like, oh, I feel like literally a shitty human being. It has an impact on your mental health. It can cause issues with your identity. In these interviews, the juxtaposition of offensive comments about Black Lives Matter protesters and about police officers raise questions about harm and the weight of relative harm caused by those comments. Many students saw the potential harm in both scenarios to be equivalent, but for other students, one group was a more legitimate victim of harm than the other. For many students, it was worse to insult someone based on a characteristic that they didn't choose, race, gender identity, religious identity, et cetera, that it was to insult someone based on something they did choose, for example, a particular profession. But again, that was not universally held and there were a lot of different perspectives on this. But this idea of consent mitigating harm came up in another context as well, whether or not someone chose to be part of the conversation where an offensive comment was made. Nora described this idea saying, quote, I also think it depends on the setting a little bit. Like a high school classroom is a little different to me than a college class. A college class, you get to choose to take it. A high school history class, you have to take it. I think that everyone deserves a choice and autonomy and like freedom about what they subject themselves to and what they choose to discuss. It's important to put yourself in uncomfortable positions, but I think you should be choosing to do that because that feels like much more toxic if you aren't able to choose to subject yourself to that. So if there is harm, that leads to the question of whether the person making a harmful comment can be held responsible for that harm, either morally or through some form of actual punishment or consequence and how then that responsibility does or should reflect on their character. For many, a big question of moral responsibility came down to a question of whether or not the student making the comment knew better. Often, this was reflected in questions about whether this was a first-time comment or something the student was known to do frequently. Another big topic of conversation was whether intent matters in terms of responsibility. Does it matter if a student had a good intention in making the comment, even if it had a negative impact. Jason reflected this tension um, at one point focusing on impact, conceding that there, if there were, quote, a scenario where it wouldn't hurt anybody and that's for sure, then yeah, that's fine. Later though, Jason focused a lot more on intent, saying, quote, I think intent matters a lot. If he was making an honest attempt to be better and recognize what he said once he was called out for it, then I think that's a situation where they can progress and go forward with the conversation. But if he was just trying to get a rise out of that student or student population, then yeah, he's being a dick and you need to address it. This all then points to the question of the extent to which uh, what we do, uh, the extent to which we do or should make judgments about a person's character based on what they say. Many of the conversations we had with students about intent, uh, when you really dug into it, came down to this question of character. Um, Jenny explained this saying, quote, you never want to purposefully hurt people like that. And I think it's a really bad reflection on your character to be saying stuff like that out loud. You can extrapolate how he's going to act in other situations too. And I feel like it makes him look, I don't know, just makes them sound very rash and very single-minded and aggressive. And it brings up all these words that I would think of as bad character. These character judgments are important because who we are inside the classroom is not walled off of who we are or how we're perceived by others outside of the classroom. And a number of students reflected on this connection between the relationships they have in and out of the classroom. For example, Eve put this very succinctly saying, it's not like you separate your academic from your social life. For many students, 
another complicating factor in those connections in that social life is that the social connections they make in college are also likely to turn into professional relationships after they graduate. This was particularly the case for students in professionally oriented majors like architecture, education, athletic training. Emily, for example, said, quote, a lot of times I feel like it would be more worth it to maintain a solid working relationship. Yes, there could be certain things benefited by bringing up those different ideas and getting to think about it. But then in the end, I feel like in a lot of these situations, it's how do I get along and work with people I'm around it will end up being more important because it just improves the quality of relationships in the workplace. So I'm going to leave off there because hopefully what I've shared with you all has raised a lot of good questions for further discussion. Um, and I want to turn it back over to Michelle for some Q&A. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, you know, people who know me and know the center know that I love nuance and um, and I love like peeling things away like an onion. So there's a lot to peel away here. And I'm going to take a uh, moderator's prerogative before we turn to the questions um, in the Q&A. So drop them in and yeah. um, ask you a couple of things. And one of the things I want to ask you about is, you know, you mentioned social media. I want to talk also about news media, 24-7 news cycle and the fact that you know, when I went to college, you got information from many fewer sources. And I want to ask you a little bit about how you think or how the students that participated um, in the study felt about kind of the news and the narrative um, that kind of occurs regularly in the news about how scary it can be to speak in class. Yeah, so I think this is a really good question, really important, because one of the things that surprised me the most um, was how connected students were to that narrative. I don't know why I didn't think they would be, um, but students know that there's this narrative out there that um, people like them, and this cut across a lot of different like thems, um, can't speak up in class, can't share their perspectives in class for lots of different reasons. And so that led a lot of students to preemptively hold back their opinions, even if they had never had a negative experience, never seen anyone have a negative experience. And some students had had negative experiences and had seen negative things happen, of course. Um, but a lot of students talked about how this, my brother tells me that I that people like us can't share my opinion in class. That sort of thing was really um, making them very apprehensive about saying anything and making that calculation of should I talk or should I not um, definitely weigh in the favor of not. Again, even if they had no direct experience with, with any sort of problems of, of negative repercussions for speech. The other dimension of this is more on the social media side um, but I think that that sometimes gets elevated to, um, you know, national media discourse um, where some of that breaking down of, of barriers between contexts. Similarly, like when I went to college, if I said something stupid in class, like the people in class might be mad at me, but it wasn't, it wasn't likely to go anywhere. Um, but that's not necessarily the case anymore. Students were apprehensive about being recorded, um, about someone recording something that they said and then it being taken out of context and spread around and getting just blown up. Um, and I think even with social media today, that's not super likely to happen. I'm, I can tell you as a college instructor, people still say plenty of stupid things in class and it doesn't, nothing ever bad ever happens, but that risk um, is real and it feels real to people for sure. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, I'm gonna um, be magnanimous and turn to some of the Q&A um, rather than be selfish and ask my own questions. Um, a couple of ones coming in, um, one having to do with how did you operationalize offensiveness and what were some of the offensive comments? Um, yeah, so I, what we did is we, we presented students initially in the survey with one of two scenarios. They were randomly assigned to um, either a scenario where a student makes a comment about Black Lives Matter protesters or about police officers, um, very intentionally designed to um, sort of trigger offense for people on different ends of the political spectrum. Um, so in the one scenario, since you asked, I'll tell you what the comments are. Um, <laughs> in one scenario, um, Jamie says, uh, I think Black Lives Matter protesters are racist against white people. And I don't think that th these thugs should be 
uh, yeah, these folks should be violently destroying their own communities, no matter how ghetto they are. Um, and in the police officer scenario, the Jamie says, I think cops are racist against black people. And I don't think these pigs should be violently attacking protesters in their own communities. I think I got those right. Um, so I developed the scenarios sort of based on some previous work from social psych. Um, and uh, you, some of it was just guesswork about if they'd be offensive to people. I thought they probably would be. I wanted them both to sort of like come up to that line, um, but not cross it to where everyone would say, oh my God, that's terribly offensive. You can't say that. Um, and I think we did a pretty good job because of the vast um, array of responses. We got to both scenarios where we had students saying, that's not offensive at all. That's totally fine to say. And other students saying to the exact same scenario, I can't believe someone would say that. That's awful. And both both scenarios, we had we had the range of responses. In the interviews, we talked with students about both scenarios, the scenario they saw in the survey, and then we presented them with the other scenario to get the, the contrast. Okay, I hope, I think that was really great to get those details. I'm just going to kind of go through um, the list. One question is about the extent to which students are fearful of official disciplinary investigations and punishment for their classroom comments. Um, I found very little of that um, in conversations with students. Um, mostly it was how other students would react. Um, again, often without direct experience with other students reacting negatively, which I think is really important. Um, and the students themselves and how they described how they would react to other students um, generally was not censorious. Um, there were things people thought other students shouldn't say, but then the response was was mostly education. Like, hey, they probably just don't know better. We need to like, they need to learn some stuff. Um, they might not realize how that affects other people. Um, but rarely were students afraid of official discipline. Some students wanted official discipline for um, comments that they saw as particularly offensive. That was um, actually that, yeah, that was part two of yeah, the part yeah. question, which is, you know, did they support such punishment? And sometimes, sometimes. Um, but again, the, the punishment was usually educational in nature, unless it was something where, and this gets at the like responsibility question, the moral responsibility question of like, so do you somehow know that they like were trying to hurt other people? Were they, do you, but students would generally say like, you, you can't ever really know that. You can sort of get a sense of it, but you can't really act on that. Um, often it was like, is this a repeat thing? Has the student been said like, told like, Hey, that's not cool. Don't say that. Like, hey, this is not this is not how we interact in this classroom. And do they keep doing it? Then that would rise for some students to a like, okay, someone needs to get involved and like there needs to be some sort of consequence for this. But again, it was generally like some sort of educational thing. Um rarely, rarely. I, I, there may have been one or two students who brought up things like suspension or things like that, but that's not where students were going for the most part. Um, so yeah, th there wasn't, and, and there were plenty of students who were like, no, no matter what, this is not something like, I can, I could say you shouldn't say that, but no, they shouldn't be punished for it. There was a, a plenty of that response as well. Okay. Great. Next, um, a question um, from Brian about the I, the concept of the good old days and when students were, was it students talking about it, I guess? And when they were talking about it, what was their reference point? I think it was not the students, but. No, this was more my insight from hearing students talk about what class was like. And, and particularly that quote from Mark, the reason that I included it is because it was one that was an aha moment for me when he talks about how like, well, if you're in a classroom and everyone's white, and everyone thinks exactly like you, it's really easy to say offensive things. Um, and that sort of, that and other students' comments about like how complicated these things are um, helped me to see a lot of the narrative about um, speech on campus, particularly when people reference like, well, when I was in school, this is what it was like. It helped me see those things in a different light. Um, because I think, like Mark said, <laughs> if you're in a room and there's, it's only white people or only like 
white Christian men. Um, and I'm not saying that that's every classroom that's ever happened in the history of the United States, but we do know that there was a lot of systematic exclusion of people from higher education for many, many, many years. And so the people who would have been offended, it's not that they weren't offended, they just weren't there. And so I think we need to keep that in mind as particularly those of us who have been out of school for a while in thinking about like how we compare our experiences with what students are experiencing now. So the students weren't talking like historically about things generally. It was just me processing what they were telling me about their experiences. Okay, great. Now, Scott has a question that was on my list of questions to ask, which is, um, did, you research, did your research generate insights about how educators can or should develop skills in college students to express and engage unpopular or controversial opinions, co-curricular programming, instructional design, engagement at the K through 12 level, et cetera? It's a big question. Yes, yes, all of those things. So I think there's a lot more that we can be doing. I think what I learned from students is that many of them haven't, don't have practice with this before they come to college. Um, not all of them, but even those who said like, yeah, in high school, we talked about all sorts of like, you know, political issues. Generally, they only talked about political issues with people who agreed with them. Um, and most students didn't talk about political stuff or controversial stuff in high school, especially in class. Like that just wasn't part of their education before coming to college. And so they really felt like they were left hanging, like they didn't know how to navigate this. Um, and I think one of the, there's a lot of great dialogue programs out there, a lot of really great initiatives to help students learn the skills to have difficult conversations with one another. I think one unique thing that uh, my research has helped me understand about some of this is that helping students engage with what's actually complicated, naming it, exploring those issues um, can also be really helpful, I think, because um, these are things that are, are often under the surface, like questions of moral responsibility and victimization and victimhood or epistemology, right? Like you might get this in a philosophy degree or a philosophy course, but I think we can actually um, pull a lot from philosophy and other liberal arts that help us understand um, complex moral dilemmas um, in ways that could be really helpful to students as they try to navigate what is actually a really morally complex situation. Um, the other takeaway that I will mention sort of goes back to this, what is the narrative that's out there um, versus what's the like lived experience of students um, is I would encourage everyone to um, challenge overly simplistic narratives that that you hear when you when you encounter people saying like you know oh kids these days anything that 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 sounds like kids these days um, immediately like sets up a, a red flag for me of like this is probably not um, probably not really grasping the full complexity of the situation that kids these days are in um, and so challenging that encouraging people to just think more complexly and in a more nuanced way about what's happening in college classrooms and how hard it is to navigate, um, I think could go a long way towards shifting uh, the overall discourse. So that's a little bit more like, that's not like a concrete, like here's a pedagogical strategy you can use um, beyond the like engage in moral philosophy, don't cut philosophy programs and defund the liberal arts. Like that's, <laughs> that's pretty concrete, but um, also just like day to day as you encounter these issues, um, challenge those narratives. And I just want to add, even though, you, Beth, you might not be naming specific pedagogical ways of doing things, to the extent that folks on um, the webinar today want to put that into the question and answer, and we can kind of create some resources that when we send out um, or send to people, like, we are happy to do that, right? Because there's probably people on here who maybe have used certain kinds of programs, so feel free to drop that in. I'm going to move on to a next question from Amy. Um, the first part is sort of just more, I think, she sort of asked asking generally, but to the extent, Beth, you have comments. She said, I have the sense on my campus that fewer students are signing up for electives that address potentially controversial subjects. It feels like many constituents on campus have lost faith in the ability to have these conversations in a productive way. Do other people see this? So, you know, Beth, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. And then her second part has to do with how, um, you know, what's been happening since October 7th on campuses, does that make you see your research or campus conversations in any new ways? 
Um, so, okay, so for the first part, I think I I don't I can't speak to trends. Um, but what I did learn from talking with students, um, which again in hindsight seems a bit obvious, but you know, I'm a person who I like to talk about controversial things. I like to talk about talking about controversial things. <laughs> I see it's very much a like important part of a, a you know college education, a P12 education too, although we don't do a lot of it there. Um, like an important part of, of education is encountering different perspectives and engaging with them. Like that's my my educational philosophy. Um, and so I would talk to students who were like engineers and they were like, this doesn't happen in my classes. I don't like that. We don't do that. Like, why would someone say that in class? Like that wouldn't, even though like I I set it up, it's in a sociology class and they're talking about activism and protests. Like they were just like, this just doesn't happen in class. And I was like, oh, right. In most of your engineering classes, like it probably doesn't come up. You're not talking about Black Lives Matter in, you know, um, your calculus class. That probably wouldn't be appropriate in a calculus class, depending, right? There's probably ways that you can work in all sorts of things into all sorts of courses, but that wasn't students' experiences. And particularly for the students who were very, um, career focused, which as we know is a lot of students for a lot of good reasons, and that's a lot of how we sell higher ed to folks, um, like that's not what they're here for. And so that was just really helpful for me um, as someone who really cares a lot about speech and discourse and dialogue and perspective taking and all of that to be like, all oh, right, not every student sees education as that. Um, and so if we think that this is important for students, we gotta be thinking about like, oh, how do we engage all of the students, not just the ones who are signing up for the sociology of protest? Right, and Andrew, I think, has a question that's sort of the flip of what you just said, which is that you've identified um, certain professionalization degree programs where they might not wanna lean into discussion. Did you see any programs where st students might be more likely to or preferred sort of leaning into the discussion about sensitive topics? Yeah, I mean, the sociology majors, the women and gender studies majors, the ethnic studies majors, it's all the ones you would you would think of, right? Um, and again, not every sociology major is, you know, gung-ho about engaging in controversy. And there were plenty of professionally oriented students who did engage with these topics, generally not in class. Um, or they, you know, I, I forget what this student's major was, but I'm remembering a student who I talked to who was in some sort of professional type program, probably engineering, but, you know, had a gen ed course that he took that he drew from a lot in our interview because the only course he took that dealt with controversial issues, but he loved it. Like he was really into it, you know, talked a lot about that. Um, so I think it does cut across, but um, some of our stereotypes about the types of students who go into which majors and how that what that says about like their interest in different issues. I mean, yeah, of course, if you're interested in like social issues, sociology is going to be more of a natural draw. Right. So Isadora had a question about your survey and did the survey ask specifically about ideology and was uh, wait, the question just went away. Okay, hold on. Uh, and was the sample size large enough to pick up on heterogeneity based on ideology? Um, so we, so I initially just had, um, you know, very conservative to very liberal on the survey in the sort of like second round of data collection when I expanded, um, I did add, you know, their, um, political party identification because, um, as I dug more into the political ideology literature, um, I realized you could have 20 different questions that gets at different dimensions of people's political um you know ideology and identification and those being different things um so there were on the survey I, I tried to get at least sort of the basic idea um no the the survey sample size was not big enough to really get into a lot of heterogeneity um and I've spent much more time with the qualitative data um a lot of what I used the survey for was to um select participants for the the qualitative uh portion and to and to use it as like a foundation for those interviews i've done some analysis with the survey data but i don't find it nearly as interesting um okay moving on um did the students in your study talk about ways in which faculty or staff help students navigate these conversations or address offensive comments 
No. No, because you didn't ask or no, because they didn't help? Well, I, a little bit of both. Um, we didn't have specific questions where, you know, we said, you know, what have faculty or staff done to, to help you navigate this? But um, students didn't talk about faculty and staff very much. Um, sometimes, like, the faculty would come up when talking about the scenarios, and some students were like, well, how did the professor respond? What did the professor do? Um, there were some students who were very focused on, like, it being the professor's responsibility to address negative speech in the classroom, um, but that was a that was a small group of students in the overall. A lot of students really focused a lot more on how they would respond, how other students would respond, rather than um, thinking about the like authority dimensions in the classroom. Um, and it, it, like faculty and staff just didn't seem to be really relevant for a lot of students' experiences, um, which I think is telling. Um, and I think is a, uh, perhaps another implication for how those of us who are faculty or and staff on college campuses can be thinking about being more helpful um, to students because they are looking for help. They do want to know what to do. Um, and, uh, and obviously you can't generalize about all faculty and staff, yeah. but I think one of my questions is what makes you think that staff and faculty are in positions to give that help? Like, you know, Oh yeah, plenty of us aren't. Okay. Yeah. Like I, I mean, I wonder if you have, I mean, obviously you haven't studied that, but it's something that interests me, which is like, how do yeah. we assume that the adults, the adults, right, have a yeah. sense of how to help them facilitate these conversations? No, I don't, I don't think that, I don't know that anyone has the answers, right? There's a lot of strategies, a lot of ways to think about it. Um, but these, one of the reasons I want to like sort of tie in these like, moral philosophy questions here is to point out that um, there aren't actual answers in a lot of these. There's not a one right way, right way to do this. Often there's zero right ways. <laughs> there might be ways that are less bad than others, but for a lot of a lot of these, like I, I, I think I didn't answer the um, question about the um, Israel-Gaza conflict that had come up before. Um, but I think that's an example of where like there's not good ways. Like there's less bad ways <laughs> that I see of dealing with with these sorts of conflicts. Um, a lot of times there's just not good answers and that might be like really negative. Um, but I think there's a lot that faculty and staff who do have an interest in these areas, who do have some sort of skills or expertise in these areas can um, help be helpful to students. And there's a lot of room for professional development. Okay. I mean, right. Subject for, uh, more research yeah. that can be done as a fellow. Okay. Sure. Uh, another question asks, did, and how did the study deal with the problem of a comment that would be deeply important to a student's core identity, yet deeply offensive to other students, given that so much identity in today's age can be in opposition to another identity? Did that come up at all? Yeah, I mean, that was like what most of this was about. Um, and because um, for many students who we interviewed, one or the other comment was deeply offensive to them. Um, and so a lot of it was like, what, did, what sense do you make of that? Um, and then when presented with the other comment, what sense do you make of that? Um, and I think that that's why we were able to get into so much of the complexities of these issues and the, the complexities of what students are grappling with in dealing with controversial issues in the classroom um, is because exactly of this conflict, um, that something that one person says might be deeply true to them and deeply important to them and still deeply offensive to someone else who's in the room. And, and what do you do when that's the case? I can't answer that question because I think that's a deeply philosophical question that implicates things that humans have been grappling with since antiquity. Um, but I think it's important to acknowledge that that is the question. That's why it's complicated. That is why it's complicated, exactly. Uh, okay, a question from Lara, who says, I'm interested in this idea that, quote, people like me can't speak. Reminds me of work on partisan identity formation. People like me think this. Do you mm -hmm. have a sense of whether this people like me approach is a dominant part of how they approach conversation? They assume meaning students. 
for some. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, it's complicated and students are all very different, right? But I definitely heard that um, from a lot of students of um, both the, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of a, a, a conservative student in particular who talked a lot about how um, he had an older brother and a number of friends who would talk about this a lot, that people like them couldn't speak up in class. And that really affected how he thought about his position in classroom discussions. But then in different ways, you know, students across the political spectrum experienced this idea of like what people like me say or do. Um, I heard some from, you know, more liberal students of the, the dynamic of well, people like me just don't say those sorts of things. Like if I were to say that, then I would be ostracized because I'd be like out of step with what people like me say and do. Again, not like the dominant thing that students talked about, but it was there for some students, um, particularly those who their, their like social community on campus was a like far left. So I think students who were, were more surrounded by um, politically engaged, politically active, um, like-minded students, how to, again, I can't make like a generalization here, but just thinking about some specific students in those situations that did seem to um, affect them. Um, but again, it, it, it wasn't all students, but that dynamic does exist for sure. Okay. Um, Carlos asks, did any students argue that certain topics should be excluded from discussion? Yes. Mm -hmm. And could you articulate or share, if, if possible, what those might have been or included? Um, yeah, so often this came up when, like, we would push them because we'd try to push them to, like, find a limit, right? I would keep, like, pushing them and be like, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? Right? Like, let me get to a point where you will say, like, no, I just, I just can't. I just can't say that that's okay to talk about in class. Um, so like Nazis are good, slavery was good. Um, a lot of times those were the things that students were like, eh, I mean, that's maybe a step too far. Um, use of the N-word was almost universally no. Um, not all, but across political identities, um, most students were like, yeah, no, no, that, that one's, that's no. Um, but in terms of like ideas, you really, for most students had to get pretty extreme before they'd be like, yeah, no, you can't, you can't, you can't say that in class. That's just um, too much. Um, some students were, you know, um, I, I, I feel like I was surprised by how many students on the conservative side of things in particular, although one or two liberal students were like, no, you really shouldn't be able to like call cops pigs um, or criticize the police like that or like make generalizations like that. But it often came down to like, they'd say like, well, it's about the generalization. Um, if you were to say like, some cops are racist or some Black Lives Matter protesters are racist, that's okay. But like a lot of students didn't like the generalization saying you know even though it didn't say all in the comment the implication was sort of all so that's where I started I saw more students saying like no you that's not an appropriate thing to say because it's you can't support it it's a generalization uh, but that was more about painting such a white you know painting it with such a white brush versus no you can't talk about racism in Black Lives Matter or racism in policing um generally that was all okay to discuss if you did it in a better way i mean i have been following your research you know closely over these years and i guess each time i just it re reminds me that maybe we're not giving students enough credit mm -hmm. for how deeply right they are thinking about the complexities of all of these things like i'm always like re fascinated by that um, let's see if we can get through a couple more questions. Um, Echo wrote, how do you think of academic freedom in this context? Um, I don't, you know, she said, is it just too complex to define um, this issue? You know, I, I also wonder if students talked at all about their professors saying things that they felt like were offensive as opposed to peers. Um, professors saying things that were offensive rarely came up. Okay. It did come up a couple times. There were a few students who had just like absolutely shockingly horrible things that they had heard professors say to them 
not saying that doesn't happen it yeah but that was like one student maybe two the one student was really bad um but um in the question of academic freedom i think is a little bit separate from what i'm talking about here um and that's probably more than we have time to get into right now but what i tried to focus on mostly in the conversations was separate from like academic freedom or first amendment issues even i tried to push students to move away from the can and talk about the should right because those are really two separate questions and some students had a hard time distinguishing which was really fascinating um but i tried to be like okay like regardless of whether someone can say this in class should they and what does that mean? Um, so we sort of put aside those those yes, no questions. Um, okay, I think we have time for, let's see, one more came in. Um, it sounds like the description of the good old days as non-diverse oversimplifies and fails to deal with the time period when there was plenty of diversity, but not a well-developed antagonistic social media playing field. How do you see this time period in terms of your research study? So my research is not, historical in nature. What I'm more reflecting on in that section is um, the way that our view of the good old days might be flawed. <laughs> um, because I think I think that it is. Um, I would love to hear more about this time period where there was plenty of diversity on campus period. Um, and when there was plenty of diversity on campus and not restrictions, whether they be formal or informal on what people say, because I don't think that that has ever happened. I do think that that's, that is separate from the social media ecosystem, which does affect dynamics in the classroom, um, particularly with what I was talking about before of this like breaking down of barriers between different spaces. I think that social media makes those boundaries of different contexts and different spaces more porous in ways that complicates what happens in those spaces. Um, so I don't know that really answered the question, but that's my, those are my thoughts on it. So before we officially wrap up, I want to give you, I mean, I thought this was wonderful and I loved all the engagement. I don't know if you had any final or closing thoughts that you wanted to share or anything that you weren't able to articulate through this before we kind of officially wrap up. I don't think so. I think we got to a lot of the, the important parts. I, you know, something I'm gonna keep working on. So I welcome folks' feedback and thoughts and suggestions, comments, reactions, all of that. Um, you know, feel free to engage with me um, outside of this webinar as well. Uh, and I was gonna say, we're gonna put uh, a link to Beth's research and you know how to find her again um, in the chat. And I'm sorry if we weren't able to get to your questions. Um, I did the best that I could. There's always more to talk about and I'm sure we will have Beth back. Um, and I just want to, um, you know, end by not only thanking Beth um, and reminding you about our institutional speech event, um, and then also letting you know that if you didn't get to see the, our last two fellows in the field events, uh, you can find the recordings of the events on our website. And then really, I think um, our final podcast episode for the year will be coming out in a couple weeks. But I think most importantly, just wishes uh, for a healthy and happy and restful holiday season. I know everybody has been working so hard generally and then over time, given everything that's been happening and just the I hope you'll always continue to keep the center in mind um, as a resource. And as we move into 2024, um, to the extent that there are topics you would like us to address or particular speakers you'd like to hear from, please reach out to me or Melanie or drop it in the, you know, our, our general mailbox so that we can find out what's of interest to you because we really try to cater um, to what the people like you who are doing this work day in and day out um, need. So Beth, it's always a pleasure. Um, I always learn so much from you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. All right. See everybody soon. <laughs>